Hello and welcome to The World at One with me, Sarah Montague. The first witness at the public inquiry into the NHS blood scandal has spoken of being robbed of his future when he was infected with HIV and hepatitis C. Derek Martindale is one of thousands of patients who were given contaminated blood in the 1970s and 80s in what's being called the worst treatment scandal in NHS history. On the opening day of hearings, the chairman, Sir Brian Langstaff, said the inquiry would be frightened of no one and have people at its heart. Our health correspondent, Sophie Hutchinson, reports. Sir Brian Langstaff described the evidence he'd read as harrowing, incredibly moving and sometimes chilling. He praised the witnesses for their courage in coming forward. First up was Derek Martindale, who had severe haemophilia. Sitting next to his son for moral support, he spoke, sometimes with his voice breaking, of the trauma he'd suffered. Like so many thousands, he had been treated with infected blood products and contracted hepatitis C and HIV. His brother had also been infected and died of AIDS. A doctor advised the then young men to keep their infections a secret because of the stigma. Mr Martindale said he felt he was giving evidence for his brother Richard and for everyone else who didn't have a voice anymore. Police have begun a new criminal investigation into the deaths of hundreds of patients at a hospital in Hampshire between 1987 and 2001. Last year, an independent report found that the lives of more than 450 people were shortened after they were given strong painkillers without clinical justification at Gosport War Memorial Hospital. Three previous police inquiries ended with no charges being brought. Our correspondent Duncan Kennedy reports. The news that the police are to begin a full investigation is what the relatives of those who died at the Gosport War Memorial Hospital wanted. They've always believed that the three previous police investigations have been inadequate, a view confirmed by last year's independent inquiry into what happened at the hospital. That inquiry, led by the former Bishop of Liverpool, found that more than 450 patients probably died because they were given strong painkillers for no medical reason. Today, the Assistant Chief Constable of Kent, Nick Downing, told the relatives that the families of those affected are at the heart of everything we do and I hope the news that we will now be carrying out a full investigation is of some comfort to them. The first witness has been giving evidence this morning to the infected blood inquiry. It was set up after thousands of NHS patients were given blood and blood products that were infected with HIV, hepatitis C and other diseases. Over the coming months, the public inquiry will hear how that happened, how it was covered up and what should be done now. 4,800 people of those infected in the 70s and 80s were haemophiliacs. More than 2,000 of them are thought to have died. Thousands more may have been exposed through blood transfusions after an operation or childbirth. One victim's widow has said of the inquiry that she wants justice and she wants people to be held to account. Andrew Bomford has been at the hearing this morning. And Andrew, what's been happening today? Yes, hello, Sarah. Yes, a really significant day for the infected blood inquiry, which um, the lead counsel, Jenny Richards, described today as the biggest public inquiry ever undertaken in the UK. And as you said, today we've begun to hear the very first testimony from the people who were both infected and affected by the contaminated NHS blood supplies from the 1970s right through the 1980s into the early 1990s. Uh, Many of them, as you said, were haemophiliacs and the first witness that we heard this morning was Derek Martindale, who has severe haemophilia. Um, His brother as well was also uh, infected with, um, uh, also had haemophilia as well. And Derek Martindale described how um, he Uh, developed HIV and hepatitis C as a result of being given infected blood clotting agents um, in the 1980s. In fact, he described how he was told on February the 13th uh, of September, uh, sorry, on Friday the 13th of September 1985 that he had HIV and he was told then that, rather bluntly, that he had one year to live and he was just 23 years old at the time. I mentioned his brother Richard, um, he also had haemophilia and he also received uh, contaminated blood supplies and got HIV. And in a very moving moment this morning, uh, Derek described the time shortly before Richard's death Um, when Richard wanted to talk to him about his fears. He knew he was dying. He he knew he had AIDS and that he didn't have long to live. 
and um, he just wanted to talk. He wanted to talk about this, talk about his fears, how scared he was. But I, I couldn't. It, it, it was it was too close to home for me, and, and I wasn't there for him. And three months later, he died. It's the biggest regret of my life because he's gone and I can't do anything to make amends for that. Andrew, what is the scale of the inquiry? What's it covering? It is um, absolutely immense. I mean, um, Jenny Rich has described um, some of the data collection that's been going on, for example. So far, they've gone through two and a half million pages of records from the Department of Health, two million pages of records from the NHS, and they've got 5.7 million more pages to search through yet, to say nothing of uh, records in the National Archives and from the Welsh and the Scottish governments. But one of the big problems they've got is that many of these medical records have been destroyed. For example, um, in the case of uh, Derek Martindale, who we heard there, he said he had a full set of medical records from 1964 right through to 1984 when he was given these contaminated blood supplies. But there, the records just finish in 1984 and they're completely missing, which gives you uh, an idea of uh, some of the problems the inquiry will have to deal with. And one last thing to mention as well, that um, there was a warning as well this morning that there are probably thousands of people who are undiagnosed hepatitis C sufferers who receive blood supplies during this period of time and don't know that they have hepatitis C and there was an appeal to both doctors and the public to look out for the warning signs. It's often called the silent killer hepatitis C and uh, if, if people are, are aware of flu-like symptoms they should go forward to their doctors because many more are still uh, to be discovered. Andrew Bomford, thank you. Nicholas Sainsbury was a child when he was infected in the 70s whilst he was a pupil at a specialist boarding school called Trelaw in Hampshire. It provided medical treatment for pupils on site. I suffer from haemophilia and I was infected with HIV and hepatitis C through my factor eight treatment for the haemophilia. I was infected probably late 70s, early 80s. Mm, and factor eight is one of these blood products. Uh, I mean, what, what is startling is many of those yes. with you at the school were also infected and have since died. 89 of us were infected, and I think there's 16 of us still alive. Most were dead by their early 30s. When were you diagnosed with HIV? The mid-1980s, I forget the exact time, as it's a bit of a blur, but it was when there were all the terrible adverts on the television with the tombstones falling and don't die of ignorance. And it was later that you were diagnosed with hepatitis C? Yes, in fact, I wasn't informed of my hepatitis C diagnosis until we'd reached a financial settlement with the government which banned us from taking any action for hepatitis viruses. So they withheld that information from us until we'd settled for HIV and signed away our rights to settle for hepatitis C. What, you're saying the authorities knew you had hepatitis C? Oh, they knew that we had hepatitis C as well, but they covered it up. And this has been the problem. We've had a 30-year cover-up of of what's happened. So what are your hopes about this investigation, this inquiry? I'm hoping that, so far as is possible, we will get the answers as to why the warnings were ignored not to use it why we didn't achieve self-sufficiency in producing it here in Britain ourselves rather than importing it from America. And really, we just want to know who took certain decisions and why. But obviously, it can't put right the past. It can't bring back the people that we've lost. All it can maybe do is give some sort of answer to those people who have lost loved ones. How do you explain how it's affected your life? Well, you walk a tightrope with it. I mean, the first few years of HIV were the worst, as I was hearing all the, t- all the time about people who I'd been at school with who died. And you were thinking, am I going to be next? How long have I got? And just trying to get on with life with that sort of Damocles hanging over your head is very difficult. Did you ever get compensation for the hepatitis C? We've had some ex gratia payments, yes, but never actual compensation because successive governments have refused to admit liability. I think it's disgusting. I'm just hoping the inquiry will make the government take responsibility.
How do you feel What's about happened? the fact that it's been covered up at various points? Well, it's outrageous. It's been covered up at the, the highest level of government. Many documents have been destroyed, gone missing, been mislaid. We certainly think that a lot of documents have been deliberately destroyed to protect people. Now, the haemophiliacs as a group were able to get in contact with each other and organise on this. There are thousands more who had blood transfusions at the time, and that's been harder to get a yes. grip of, of who's affected, isn't it? It is, yes. In fact, I understand now that the recommendation that many campaigners like myself are saying is that people who had a blood transfusion before 1991 should consider having a test for hepatitis C just to make sure they're OK. Because there still may be people who don't know that they've been infected. Yes, this is the unknown quantity. It might be very few or it might be a great number. We just don't know. Nicholas Sainsbury. Lord Owen was Minister for Health when he first began to understand the dangers of the contaminated blood scandal. He spoke to Mark Mardell when the inquiry was opened in September last year. There's no doubt there has been, in my view, a very deep cover-up ever since it became aware of the fact in this country that there were going to be criminal charges levelled in the French courts. And I think that panicked everybody. And that's when my documents in my, in my period were pulped and also those of uh, the Conservative Secretary of State for Health, Patrick Jenkin. What's the evidence for that? Well, we've been told that our papers have been pulped. We've told that our papers can't be uh, returned to us, that they weren't kept for the 30 years rule, which used to apply to government papers. And uh, so we know that this, this part of it is, is clear. Why, how... We don't know. Lord Ern. Well, Diana Johnson is a Labour MP, chairs the all-party parliamentary group on haemophilia and contaminated blood. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Given that we're talking about something that was so long ago uh, and the procedures have all changed, a lot of the documents have gone, as Nicholas Sainsbury said, you can't put right the past. What is it that this inquiry can do? Well, I think there are two things. First of all, I think there are lots of questions that we will be able to get answers to as to why decisions were taken at certain times over the last uh, few decades that meant that contaminated blood was allowed into our uh, system. But the second point, and I think this is very important, is... There has never been, as Nick said, a, an admission of liability on behalf of the state. And what we're hoping is that when the recommendations from the inquiry uh, are written, one of the things that they will be uh, set out is that there was clear liability by the NHS, by the state, and that will therefore open up then the opportunity for proper compensation to be paid to these people. And you will have heard already some of the harrowing tales of what it's meant to people uh, throughout their lives to have received contaminated blood and they've never had proper financial compensation. Okay. And, and, and as far as what else we learn, because it's one thing to say, look, there's compensation um, for those who are affected. Is it a, about the past and making a proper compensation for it or are there lessons for the future? Well I think there may well be lessons for the future and of course you have to look back and trawl through to see that all the lessons have been learned that means now we have a, a much safer system but I do think the fact that many individuals today in this country are just getting by on very limited financial support, ex gratia, means tested often, by paid by the government. These people have not had compensation for, for their lives being ruined and that's I think one of the key things that we fought for a long time to have a public inquiry to set out really how this has affected people's lives and I think the general public will be shocked by what's happened to this group of haemophiliacs and others who have never had proper support and compensation for the, the harm that the state did to them. Okay but, but and also the number that may be undiagnosed because things changed in about the mid 80s to early 90s but anybody prior to that who had in fact affected blood may yet 
uh, be affected by it. Yes, that's right. And, and, and it's always been very difficult to know what the true figures of this are because obviously you have the haemophilia community, the bleeding disorder community. We kind of know the numbers there and they're shocking. But for the wider public who may have had routine surgery or in childbirth needed a transfusion, you're absolutely right. We don't know what the numbers are there that may have contracted hepatitis C in particular. Uh, you heard Lord Owen there talking about t- discovering that his papers had been pulped. That it seems to be a sort of running theme. Is it still the case that there could be some criminal investigation that follows as a result of this, as a result of a cover-up? Well, I wouldn't rule it out. And of course, in other countries in the world, in France in particular, ministers have gone to prison for decisions that they took uh, when they were in office. So I think it would be wrong to rule out that uh, there may well be criminal investigations that have to be carried out. And there's certainly been talk about um, uh, records being disposed of or or, uh, removed. And um, Andy Burr and particularly talked about that being done on an industrial scale. So certainly I think there may well be issues where the police would would want to look. Diana Johnson, thank you.